Good morning. Glad to see you're all out here this morning, even though you're getting some of you are getting extra credit, right? <laughs> Welcome to Livermore and to the Science on Saturday at the Bankhead Theater. A big thank you goes to the Nor Liver Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, who produces these science presentations with the help of our local educators. This morning's topic is put it back when you're done. Now, who's heard that at home before? Who says that at home? Yeah, okay. But what we're talking about is storing carbon dioxide in the earth and not in the atmosphere. Everyone take a deep breath and hold it. All right, now let it out. Everybody here has just contributed to the carbon dioxide load in the atmosphere. Of the gases we exhale, 4 to 5 percent is carbon dioxide. So where does it all go? What happens to all the carbon dioxide when we burn fossil fuels such as coal and oil? And what do we do about it? That's what our guest speakers will be discussing today. With us today is earth science teacher Ken Waddell from Tracy High School and Dr. Roger Ames from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. Ken teaches earth science and earth science for English language learners at Tracy High School. He developed the earth science program at Tracy High and has worked on the curriculum mapping and curriculum alignment to the California state standards for the high schools in Tracy. Ken works with action learning systems creating California Earth Science Standards based on benchmark tests. He has his Bachelor of Science degree from ge in Geology from California State University at Stanislaus. And when not teaching, Ken is interested in backpacking the Sierra Nevada mountains and exploring the national parks with his family. Roger is a member of the Global Security Directorate at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where he leads the Carbon Fuel Program. Roger holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Chemistry from Carleton College and a Doctor of Philosophy in Geochemistry from the California Institute of Technology. A key research area for Roger, Roger has been coupling, the coupling of active remediation methods to longer term self-actuating methods like oxidation and bioremediation. Please welcome Mr. Ken Waddell and Dr. Roger Ames. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck, and, and welcome. Fossil fuels. We, we take a lot of energy out of the ground in the form of what we call fossil fuels. And what do we mean by fossil fuels? When I was a kid, there was a, there was a uh, ad on TV all the time that basically told me that gasoline came from dinosaurs. Well, not quite. It's actually mostly plants. But the point is that these are, are fuels that were alive millions and millions of years ago. They've been underground. They've been safely stored underground. And now we want to take them out and use the energy. Oil and coal are the two major fossil fuels that we talk about. So they've been underground for all this time. We want to take them out and use them. And what happens when we take them out and use them? Well, fossil fuel is basically carbon. We burn that carbon by combining it with oxygen from the atmosphere and we turn it into CO2. That CO2 now has no particular use. It's basically trash. And what have we been doing with it for hundreds of years since the Industrial Revolution? We've been just throwing it up in the air. Now, that's a very convenient thing to do sometimes when you're done with something, you just want to chuck it over. Uh, many of you probably have this problem on the floor of your rooms. Um, but after a while, you, you start piling it up and it starts to, to catch up with you. And pretty soon you can't see the floor of your room and then you can't walk in your room. And that's the situation that we've reached in this planet. We've been throwing this trash, this carbon dioxide, up into the air for so long that it's really built up to the point where it's a problem. Now, the thing about carbon dioxide, just as this active power plant 
this thing is, is burning coal, it's turning it into carbon dioxide, it's putting it up in the atmosphere, and what you see coming out of that stack is just really the heat coming out of it. You can't see the carbon dioxide. But it's an enormous amount of carbon dioxide, and we've been dumping this in, and, and so one of the first things we wanted to start off with this morning was just a little bit of a demonstration of how much carbon dioxide we're talking about when we burn fossil fuels. So, Ken? I brought along a uh, little box of coal here. This is about a pound or half a kilogram. And this is how much coal it takes to light 10 light bulbs, 10 100 watt light bulbs in your house for an hour. So it seems kind of small and compact, but a typical family burning 10 light bulbs is not that much. I chase after my own kids to turn off the lights. Um, but if you times that by six hours of an evening, just a typical evening, how much coal does that end up being? If this is half a kilo for one hour's worth, six hours would be what? Somebody shout it out. Three kilos. Three kilos, about six pounds. So that starts to mount up. If you add on top of that, maybe you did a load of laundry, maybe you ran the dishwasher, you were on the computer, all the other electronic devices in your house, that mounts up to a lot of coal for a family for an evening, times however many people are in Livermore, times the state of California, times the US, it's a huge amount of coal. So when we take that coal and um, the carbon that comes out from the power plant mixes with the oxygen in the atmosphere, it combines for carbon dioxide. And that's gonna make a gas that we're putting in. So when you combine the carbon with the oxygen, how much carbon dioxide is that gonna make? And we'll try and fill up this balloon to the size that it would be about. You ever done a little squeaky with the balloon? Lots of noise? Does the same thing on this. So how much do you think we're supposed to expand up to? A think meter. Is, it, is this good? Big, who knows how big a meter is? Who can show me? Right? About like this. So yeah. are we there yet? No. no. Did the front row get their eyeglass protection? <laughs> oh, we forgot that. Is that about a meter? No. More? Wow, that's a lot of carbon dioxide. <laughs> he practiced all morning to get those noises right. <laughs> Close? Good. All right. So, again, this is the amount of coal, and then that carbon combined with oxygen making carbon dioxide makes approximately this amount of gas. And this is what we're dumping in times all the other light bulbs, all the electrical appliances that we need. Thank you, Ken. We're going we're to leave that up there for you guys to uh, keep an eye on during the talk. It's not going to change, we don't think. Depends on how good he is with the rubber band. But, you know, the point is here, we're not talking 
about a small amount of stuff. It happens to be colorless, it happens to be clear. It's not dangerous to us. We all saw how we exhaled a bunch of carbon dioxide at the beginning of this uh, talk. But it is trash, and it is in the atmosphere, and it is building up to the point that it's having pretty significant impacts. Now, some of us don't mind those impacts, but others of us do. And uh, I can tell you from my own personal experience that there's a lot of debate about climate change and how real it is, but that debate is not among scientists. There are no reputable scientists who don't believe that climate change is an extremely important thing, who don't believe that it's happening. We argue a lot about exactly what's going to happen. We argue about what we should do about it, because it's going to cost a lot of money. But the, the idea that there's a debate about whether climate change is happening is something that happens in the press. It's not happening in the scientific community. One of the things that I'm most worried about is what happens in the Arctic. We have our polar bears here now. I happen to be very fond of polar bears, even though they're the only animal that actively hunts human beings. Uh, but they require ice. They can't live without ice. They hunt their seals on ice. And so let's just take a little quick look at what's happening to Arctic ice. Over the, stop this for a second, you're going to see white is thick ice and blue is thin ice. And we're going to look at it over the last five or six years, just most recently. It's a, NASA put up a nice satellite to do this and made these nice movies for us. Every year the ice is getting thinner. In fact, during the summer, in some places the ice is so thin that it's possible that the Northwest Passage may open. Two years ago, the Northwest Passage almost opened during the summer. What's that mean? It means that you could have sailed from Alaska to Europe on water. The ice is thinner now, and another way that we know that it's thin, and, and I kind of like this story, is that Russia and the United States are separated by this Arctic ice. The North Pole is right where you see that thick ice, the white ice there. And we've been sailing submarines underneath that ice since the 1960s. Why have we been doing that? So that they could lurk off the Russian coast and be prepared to fire missiles at them. And if they want to fire those missiles, they'd have to go through the ice. So they've been measuring the thickness of the ice very carefully since the 60s. The ice is now half as thick as it was when we first started doing that. It's an enormous change. And we care very much about what happens in the Arctic for other reasons. We'll come back and talk about it a little bit later. But one of the things that happens up there is that there, all, underneath all that ice is a whole bunch of peat moss that may oxidize and turn into other things that can hurt the atmosphere, into methane, if we're not careful. Well, how are we doing? We, we've recognized that this is a problem for a while. And the, na the nations of the world are coming to recognize that it's a problem. That's lagging behind the scientific evidence. But uh, so we've been trying to figure out how bad is it going to be. So back in the year 2000, a bunch of scientists got together and said, let's predict what's going to happen. Let's make some good and some bad predictions. So the good predictions say, what if we used really efficient light bulbs? And what if we insulated our houses and we got better cars? And, and we used wind power and solar power and things like that. And that's the lower part of that blue wedge. That's how much carbon would be emitted if, if we did all the, the good things that we could do. And then I said, well, what if we just continued what we're doing? In fact, what if we kind of picked all the worst things that we could do? And that would be the upper red line. And that would be sort of what was gonna, they imagined was going to happen over the last 10 years. Well, what really happened is worse. A lot worse. And why is it worse? Because everybody in the world wants to have the same kind of energy that you and I have here in Livermore. Sit here under these bright lights that are so light I can barely see your faces. Uh, can you do that in India? Can you do that in Indonesia? Those people want to have energy too. And so as the third world is industrializing and is, is coming into its own, it's using the kind of energy that we've used for years. Over this 10-year period, the United States and Europe were pretty close to flat in terms of our carbon emissions. The rest of the world was climbing dramatically. So it's not going well. Things are going worse than we predicted. Now what can we do about it? We all know that there are lots of good things that we can do to get energy. We can get windmills. We have the windmills up in the Altamont Pass. These are a terrific idea. We should do as much of this as we possibly can. Solar. Solar energy is going to be a very important part of the picture, particularly in the West, here in California. When you students are grown up, most of you are going to have houses with solar panels on the roof. 
Better than that, you're going to have solar roofs that are solar panels. It's not going to be they're tacked on the top. Instead of having shingles, you're going to have solar panels. It's going to be a great thing. It's going to be generating an enormous amount of electricity. And we're getting the hang of doing that. But even with all those things being done, it looks like that can maybe provide 30% of our electricity, 30% of our energy. Well, why is that? Partly because we use so much energy, partly because wind and solar don't run all the time. The solar is great energy, but the sun is not out all the time. And we're going to need other things to provide energy. Now today, what do we do? Today we get about half of our energy from fossil fuels. In California, it's a little better than that because we're very blessed. We have hydropower. We have the, waters, the rivers that come down from the Sierra Nevada that generate electricity for us. But in the entire nation, about half of our energy comes from fossil fuels today. Is it possible for us to use those fossil fuels and still live with the carbon dioxide that we're dumping into the atmosphere? And that's the subject of today's talk. What can we do about all that carbon dioxide that comes out of these fossil fuels if we still want to continue using them? There's a lot of people who argue that we shouldn't use any fossil fuels. And the question there is, how do you make that transition? How do you go from what we're doing today to something that doesn't emit carbon dioxide. So we're going to talk about one of those options. When a power plant burns carbon or, or a factory or a refinery, they basically put it into a smokestack and it goes up into the air. One of the ways that you could catch that carbon dioxide is called post-combustion capture. After combustion, after burning, you could catch that carbon dioxide that's coming out of the stack of the power plant that I showed you. And this is a very recent uh, photograph that my friend Julia Friedman took in China of the biggest post-combustion capture plant that's running in the world. It's a 100 kilowatt demonstration, just came online. I don't know if you, you remember how big that power plant that I showed you before was and how big this one is, but it's not very big compared to a real power plant. But it's the biggest one there is and it's working. There, there's a solvent in those two tanks that grabs the carbon dioxide from the flue gas, from the gas that would go up the stack, and then the rest of the gas is sent up the stack without any carbon dioxide in it. The carbon dioxide stays behind so that we can compress it or put it into a tank like that. And there's another way to do this that we thought was going to be very clever, and it is, it is very clever, uh, but it isn't getting as much use as we thought, and that's pre-combustion. What can we do? Can we take this fuel and get rid of the carbon dioxide before we burn it? Instead of just putting it into a fire, can we get the energy in a different way? And one of the ways you could do this is creating syngas. Now syngas is much like the town gas that maybe your grandparents remember, which used to light street lights and things. People had, every city had a little town gas plant that would run this reaction, would take coal or biomass and heat it up to a very high temperature add a little water and it turns into hydrogen and carbon monoxide. That's a combustible mixture. You can burn those two gases. They burn much like natural gas. Um, the problem with that was it's uh, actually kind of dangerous to have all that carbon monoxide circulating in pipes and, and you wanted to be very careful of your oven in those days. Um, Today, though, we know we can do more than that. We can take and add more water to that and actually make it entirely into hydrogen and carbon dioxide with this thing called water gas shift. Now, this is a pretty good fuel now. Now we've separated all the carbon dioxide and what we have is hydrogen that's left behind. This can be done pretty readily and it, it sounds like a, a pretty good answer. And in fact, it is a pretty good answer. It's being done at this plant in uh, North Dakota today where they're processing, catching about a million tons a year of carbon dioxide by that process. So we've got it in hand two ways to do this, to catch this carbon dioxide that we're pretty comfortable will work. What, then what do we do with it? Well, here's our balloon with our one, uh, uh, or the amount of carbon dioxide generated by one pound of, of coal or ten light bulbs for an hour, not very much, right? But we can compress that. We can put it in a compressor that looks much like the compressor you use to fill the tires of your car. Of course, it's a lot bigger and it's a lot more expensive, but we can compress that down to smaller and smaller size, and if we compress it enough, it ends up like the CO2 in that gray canister that we started with that we filled the balloons from. It turns into a liquid. That's a very convenient property of carbon dioxide. At reasonable pressures, it'll compress to the point where it turns into a liquid. And then it's relatively easy to store. In the earth, 
The depth at which that pressure occurs when there's enough water and rock over top of it to make it stay at that pressure is about 3,000 feet. So this is something we can do to put it back. To basically, we took this energy out of the ground. We can now compress, take the carbon dioxide, catch it, compress it back to a liquid, and put it back underground basically where we started. It's going to look a lot like oil at that point. It's a liquid. It's a little less viscous than oil. What's that mean? It means it's not as gooey as oil. But it basically behaves a lot like it. And we have a lot of experience getting oil out of the ground, so maybe we can use this process to put carbon dioxide back in the ground. So when I talk about putting it back in the ground, am I talking about putting it into caves? No. We're talking about injecting the carbon dioxide into the rocks themselves, into the spaces between rocks to fill up, to, to take the place of the water that was there. And Ken is going to show you a demonstration of what that looks like. I brought along a model here, and um, this is used to show some of the things that might be happening underneath um, the ground. We have many different layers below us, and some of those layers are permeable, meaning that liquid can pass through them. Others are not permeable. Um, when you dig a well and pulling out for your water, you're pulling from one of those. They call that an aquifer. So here we show different layers, and this black layer is one that's not permeable. When you take oil out of the ground, you're not taking it from K's, as he said. You're pulling it from all the little spaces between all the different rocks that are down there, those little pore spaces. And so as the oil comes out, then it's filled in with groundwater. So what we look at here is if you take and put the carbon dioxide as that liquid form back down here, then it stays put underneath that clay layer because it's just like the oil stood there underneath for a long amount of time. So we'll try to use some water here with some red food coloring for carbon dioxide. And you inject it back down your well. Of course, who can see it there? And you can start to see where the red comes up there, and it stays underneath the clay layer. It doesn't soak back up to the other parts. So we hide the carbon away from the atmosphere. It's back where it used to be as a fossil fuel, and it's separated from the rest of the ground. Thank you, Ken. I love that demonstration. We call that thing an ant box, but he doesn't like it when I saw it there. Uh, um, we're not talking about something that's being done shallow either. You know, in our demonstration, in order to have the scale appropriate, we, we have to have it look like it's pretty close. But in fact, we're talking about doing this more than 3,000 feet underground. Typically, 5,000, 10,000 feet, we're talking a mile underground. Now, where does your, your drinking water come from? A typical water well will be 100 feet underground. Over in Pleasanton, there are some drinking water wells that are 500 feet underground. So we're talking about putting the, the carbon dioxide very deep underground and well away from drinking water. In fact, at that depth, the water has been there for so long that there isn't any good drinking water anymore. It's all enormously salty. And the fact that it's so salty means that it basically can't be used for anything else other than nice space for us to store carbon dioxide. So what do we imagine would happen in the future? These two methods that I told you about, post-combustion capture, pre-combustion capture, what we imagine is that we'll be building new kinds of power plants and new kinds of factories where the carbon dioxide, instead of coming out of a smokestack, is now captured, compressed to a liquid, and injected deep into the ground, under or nearby the factory. This will get it out of the atmosphere, basically put it away permanently. And we have a lot of experience 
in doing this, but it, a lot of it comes from the oil field. And this is the first place this is going to be done because this carbon dioxide happens to have another really great property, and that is it loves oil. It's a great solvent for oil. So the first places that people have been doing this have been to try and get more oil out of oil fields. That works very nicely. You use the CO2 to get oil out of the oil field. After you've got all the oil out, you leave that space behind. You fill the space with the carbon dioxide that you want to leave there permanently. So. In a, in a lot of places, you're going to see that as the first place where power plants can generate car uh, burn carbon and generate carbon dioxide and then put it underground permanently and also generate more oil in the process. And a really important question that you guys should be asking yourselves at this point is, can we do this safely? Is this the sort of thing where we'd be comfortable doing it? We're talking about changing the energy system of the entire world. We can't emit a little bit of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we have to stop emitting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We have to do this with everything that we do. And so we have to be pretty confident that this is a, a, a safe and reasonable thing to do. And it turns out that this has been widely done in industry because production of natural gas requires that carbon dioxide be removed from the natural gas. Well, how are those two related? It turns out that underground, when you have natural gas being formed from the decay of plants and leaves and, and uh, things that are going to turn into oil, sometimes with a high enough temperature they turn into natural gas, but they also turn into carbon dioxide. So the natural gas that people, that companies take out to sell to us to put in our, our uh, stoves or in our water heaters has to have the carbon dioxide taken out of it. An example of this is this field in Algeria. Algeria is south of the Mediterranean, south of Europe, and there's a giant gas field there that supplies a lot of Europe. The gas that comes out of there is about 10% carbon dioxide. The people in Germany do not want to buy gas with 10% carbon dioxide because it won't burn. They're getting cheated. So you have to take the carbon dioxide out before you do it. Now this is done at natural gas fields all over the world. But what British Petroleum is doing at Insala is something that I'm, I'm very pleased about. On their own dime, they're saying, we're going to take that carbon dioxide out and we're going to put it back underground. We're going to store it at this site and we're going to put a million tons of carbon dioxide back underground and just practice, just find out what's happening. This is a pretty cool place. It's in the deep desert. This is a place where the only things you see are camels and uh, uh, sand. It's a Disney desert in my parlance. But uh, what they're doing there is they're injecting basically into the same place, the same sand grains that Ken showed you. He showed you these layer that has a, there's a cap over it and underneath there's, there's rocks that have space. Well that space right now has natural gas in it. It's also filled with water. They're injecting the carbon dioxide into the part that has water. So they're basically using the same natural gas formation to take and put the carbon dioxide back in. This is a great place to practice and this is the kind of way that you find out how safe this kind of thing is and what the issues are. There's, that project has been going on for three or four years. There's another project that the Norwegians have been doing up in the North Sea at the Sleipner platform. And I'm, I'm particularly proud of this one. I'm proud of the Norwegians. There's only five million Norwegians, but if you see one, you should shake his hand. Because what they have done is they've agreed to tax themselves for carbon dioxide that they emit, $50 a ton. And in order to keep from emitting more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and at the Sleitner platform, they've been catching carbon dioxide, as we saw from a natural gas. This is being produced to sell to Europe. And they've been putting it back underneath the North Sea for 10 years. Now, it's not going into the water. As you see in the little inset picture, it's actually going into the, to the rock that's underneath the water at this platform. But with 10 years of experience, we know a lot about what this looks like. And they, the Norwegians basically invested their own money to do this one. Nobody else thought it was even a big deal. 10 years ago, how many of you were thinking that this was a big deal? Not too many of us. So uh, it's really nice that they've done it because you've got to take a lot of experience to understand this. But this kind of capture process is going on around the world. We understand how to do that pretty well today. The United States 
has been thinking about this as well. We're thinking, well, if, if every coal-fired power plant, and in fact, probably every power plant, is going to eventually have to catch its carbon dioxide and put it underground, we better start practicing. We better find out what this looks like. So we formed these seven partnerships. You know how politicians like, well, it's OK when you did it over there, but I want you to do it in my area so that I understand how it affects my people and works on my rocks. OK, that makes sense. That's being done. So there's seven partnerships that have been formed here around the United States. And each one of these partnerships is supposed to inject a million tons of carbon dioxide a year underground at a site that they've chosen. The one for the California partnership is going to be north of us in the, in the Central Valley. Two of these partnerships are already started. They got through an enormous amount of paperwork. Uh, you wouldn't believe how much paperwork to do this. And uh, they've gotten started putting their million tons a year in, one site in Mississippi and one site in Illinois. There's also a number of sites around the world that are doing this. There's about 40 sites that are either in preparation or in active injection at this point, and another couple hundred that people are considering. So over the next five years, we're going to learn a lot about this process. This is the real thing. We're going to really know, does this work? What are the issues associated with it? Is it safe? Is it effective? Can we afford it? It turns out it's not very expensive to do. So the real questions are safety and effectiveness of this kind of underground storage. Well, where are we going to get this CO2 from? It turns out that's a much more difficult problem. I'm a geologist. We've been working on underground storage of carbon dioxide for 12 years. We're pretty confident that we can put it underground. But we've got to have CO2 to put underground. We have to catch it from somewhere. Where are we going to get that from? I'll we'll talk about a little bit about some of those plans. The United States has a plan to build a power plant that uses this post-combustion capture. And, I'm sorry picture up here is pre-combustion capture uh, at, a, at a plant called FutureGen. Uh, you'll see that this is just a cartoon of what FutureGen is going to look like. It's hopefully going to start construction soon. We love to uh, bang on the Chinese, but this is the Chinese version. It's already half built and it's going to start generating electricity next year. They're way ahead of us. This is good news. We just have to try these things out. We have to build these plants. We have to see how much it costs to run them. We have to see what the issues are. There are a lot of power plants around the world, and we all know that the Chinese are building one coal-fired power plant a week at this point. So this is not replacing all their carbon emissions, but they're doing a good job of trying to find out what the issues are, and are very pleased that they're advancing this topic. I don't know if you get the scale on this, how big this thing is, but there's a truck down in front of that red tower, and there's a backhoe down there. This is a gigantic operation to build this power plant. Well. Let's say we can catch the carbon dioxide. Let's say we can build the power plants that don't throw the carbon dioxide up into the air, but actually store it and put it underground. Do we have enough space to put it underground? The good news is, in the United States, we're enormously blessed. We have a lot of space underground to put this. First thing is our oil fields. This is a very rich country, and one reason is because we had a lot of oil. We still have a lot of oil, actually. Um, and the space in those oil fields is going to be the first place that carbon dioxide gets put. So that's the red. You're going to see a lot of that being done. And it's already underway at a lot of places in the United States. Why? Because we can use it to get more oil out of the ground while we also leave some carbon dioxide behind. Second thing, though, it, we're eventually going to run out of space there. Why are we going to run out of space? Because oil is not that big a fraction of our fossil fuel. Coal is a much bigger fraction. And also, remember the carbon comes out of the ground as oil, and then we burn it and add those two oxygens to it. It's a lot bigger when we're done than when we started. And so we need more space to put it back than when we started. It always seems like that when I'm cleaning up my house, too. Where, do, where does all that stuff have to go? It seems like it takes more space than when it came out. And in the case of carbon dioxide, it certainly does. The space is going to come from these things that we call saline aquifers. You mentioned Ken's example over there. It's the space between the rocks. It's incredibly salty water. It's saltier than seawater, three or even ten times saltier than seawater. It's not something you can ever drink. But it's space that we can use to store things, five or 10,000 feet deep underground. And our country, a lot of resources in that area. Most of the people in our country live on the East Coast. There's a little bit of storage over there. Frankly, the guys that drew this map were kind of generous. There isn't that much storage space over there in the East Coast. Most of the storage space in the United States is out here in the West. 
The state of Wyoming by itself could store all the emissions, carbon dioxide emissions of this country for hundreds of years. So this is going to mean a change in the way that we do things. If we're going to get energy from fossil fuel, we're going to have to think about where we put the power plants. Right now we take the coal from Wyoming and we ship it by train to Rhode Island where we burn it. Well maybe that's not the right answer in the future. Maybe we're going to make the power in Wyoming where there's space to store the carbon dioxide and ship the electricity there. These kind of changes are mean huge changes in our energy infrastructure. We're talking about changing everything that we do here and when the argument, you'll, you'll hear a lot of people say we should do these things fast and I agree we should do them as fast as we can but it's hard. We're not talking about just slap something on this power plant in Rhode Island it's all done. No, it's a bigger change than that. The good news is another thing goes on today that gives us a lot of experience and that is once we make this CO2, once we compress it to a liquid like it is in that uh, canister over there, it's taking up the small amount of space, we can put it in a pipeline. And those pipelines exist in this country today. 3,000 miles of carbon dioxide pipelines. Why do we have those pipelines? Because it's a great way to get oil out of the ground. So people are taking carbon dioxide and they're piping it to oil fields where they can use it to wash oil out of the ground. So these pipelines are something we're pretty experienced with. Frankly, putting CO2, carbon dioxide, in a pipeline is a lot easier than putting natural gas in a pipeline. Carbon dioxide is not particularly dangerous. We all saw what happened when we breathed out all that carbon dioxide at the beginning not much. Um, it doesn't start fires, it won't explode. In fact, if you had a match and you put it in the carbon dioxide, it would put the match out. It puts fires out. So pipelines are a pretty reasonable thing, but what we're talking about here is something that you all are going to have to be thinking about in the future. We're talking about changing the way that we make energy. We're talking about changing all these systems. It's not going to be business as usual. We're going to have to have solar. We're going to have to have wind. We're going to have to make all these enormous changes that you guys are going to have to do. What can we all do to help here? Well, you know, I'm, in, I'm working hard on this problem myself. What's the lab doing? We're trying to prove that this underground storage is safe. We've been working on this for 10 years. We're working with a lot of major demonstrations around the world. The four demonstrations, four of the seven demonstrations in this country, the Lawrence Livermore is helping with, and four major demonstrations around the world. We're trying to get more of those running. We think it's very important to get a lot of practice here. Practice makes perfect. Second thing, though, that actually is proving to be more important, is more difficult, is how do we catch this carbon dioxide from the places that are emitting it now, from the places that are throwing it up in the atmosphere? That chemistry, that engineering proves to be pretty darn hard. You drink, you all drink Coca-Cola that has carbon dioxide in it today. Where did that carbon dioxide come from? It came from one of those post-combustion capture plants that takes a solvent, catches the carbon dioxide after you burn natural gas in the case of doing this, and then compresses it to put into your Coke. So early on in this process, when we first realized we had a climate problem, we thought, ah, that one's not going to be hard. It turns out to be a lot harder than we thought because coupling that with big industrial plants is expensive and we all don't have enough money to do all the things we want to do, so we have to develop better ways to capture that carbon dioxide and that's going to be a hard problem and it's one that you all are going to be working on. Building one power plant in the United States of the kind that we talked about, those post-combustion uh, plants, takes between five and ten years. It's going to be a long time before we get all these things built. You guys are going to have a lot of work to do. Well, what are some other things that you guys can do? I just wrote down some things that I thought of. One of the first things is, don't put up with it. Us old guys did this to you. You shouldn't let us do that. You should demand the people clean up the mess that they're leaving. The fact that we've been putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for 200 years and it hasn't killed you yet doesn't mean that it's a good idea. Okay? You should say, hey, stop doing that, clean it up. Ask your legislators to do things, think about it yourself, think about what you're doing. Second, this is a gigantic problem. This is the entire world. Everybody wants to have energy the way we have it in the United States which means that countries like Indonesia are going to have a hundred times more energy production than they have today. They're going to be generating carbon dioxide. We all are going to have to deal with it. We have to come up with new ways. We have to have, come up with clever ways. It's not okay to say, no, you can't do that. You can't have a bankhead theater with bright lights. You don't get to do that. Of course they want that. And they deserve to have it. But we're going to have to figure out better kinds of science and better technology to do it. It doesn't exist today. You guys are going to have to do that. You're going to have to figure it out. And I'm sure that 
you all are going to have a lot of other ideas that we'd like to hear as well. But I think the, the final message that I want to leave you with is, is a, I, Ken has a bumper sticker that I just love on his truck. It says, get involved. The world is run by those who show up. Thank you very much. <laughs>